So, this uh, panel is going to be on uh, legal issues related to payments and taxation of e commerce business in India. May I request uh, Gauri Gokhale again, Simon Rice, and Mahesh Kumar. I think when we are uh, talking about this new payment gateway, it also reminds me of a uh, 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 Bitcoin story in India. You know, as I told you in the morning, uh, you know, we look at uh, new technologies, new developments in the future, and you know, so we take 5, 10, 15 years perspective and try to do it. Let me tell you how this story came up. Um, about two and a half, three years ago, we thought that bitcoins uh, will take five, six, seven, eight years and uh, take off uh, in India, uh, even in the world, you know, it will take some time. At least five to seven years was our expectation, but we started work about two and a half years ago, thinking that, you know, whenever it comes, we'll be ready, but at least we had prepared ourselves. So, one fine morning, uh, what happened, we got a call uh, from the Bitcoin industry, and we were told that there was uh, a Bitcoin trader who was raided by the Enforcement Department, Exchange Control Department in India, and the uh, uh, whole industry came to a standstill. Now what happened, uh, they came, they came uh, quickly in the afternoon because this uh, what we call kind of a raid in India had happened. Whole industry was standstill. Uh, they came and started to explain us, uh, you know, tell us, oh, we are in Bitcoin business, and they thought that we didn't know about uh, the whole thing. So they explained a little bit, and immediately we said, okay, we know a little bit about it, not as much as you know, but, and um, um, uh, uh, I said, uh, you know, it's not illegal in India. And they were a bit surprised that how do you know about all the industry. Now, fortunately, we had already done a bit of a study. And they told us, uh, why not we make a representation to government uh, and explain to them this is not illegal and therefore there's nothing wrong. In the process, uh, <clears throat> in the process what happened was, uh, uh, I said, yeah, we can make a representation, but the first thing that government will do is to appoint a committee. And once you go to government and have to make a representation committee, it will take about a year's time. So it will take about a year's time to reopen your business. Now there are other ways of handling this kind of situation, you know. And uh, <clears throat> so we said, why not we do one thing? We call a press conference and I will address them and explain about the Bitcoin. So we called a press conference uh, just next day explain almost every uh, press uh, was present and we said it's not illegal but we also told industry that your duty is to the public and to tell them that bitcoins are not illegal but that they are volatile and they are a little speculative so please do not indulge in bitcoins unless you are ready to lose some money so industry's job is to protect public interest as well but at the same time, you're not doing anything illegal. And every newspaper had uh, a statement, Bitcoin's not illegal, says Nishit Desai. Immediately, next consequence was uh, the enforcement department got a call from uh, Delhi. And um, they also were in quandary as to what is this Bitcoin. They, they thought it's all legal and they, something, you know, they should not allow. But uh, they couldn't explain fully what that whole uh, cryptocurrency was. And at the same time, RBI also appointed committee, and very quickly it came up, and uh, uh, you know the clarification came that uh, it's not illegal. People's uh, you know uh, interest will be taken into account, and within three four days, the entire industry opened up again, and we have suggested to the industry to develop their own self-regulatory regime so that you know. Uh, we believe that uh, if you do not regulate yourself, 
then government will definitely step in. So, best thing is for industry to develop own re regime, KYC norms and all the other kind of stuffs that need, need to be done. So, we are just helping on that. But there are some constructive or creative ways of solving complex problems and uh, one good thing I must say about India is that all said and done after we made this statement in the newspapers and all that, uh, government has yet not banned it. I had uh, in one of the meetings I had uh, uh, with uh, the governor of Reserve Bank of India, Raghuram Rajan, he is one of the most uh, I think celebrated uh, uh, governors in the history of Reserve Bank of India, very dynamic and you know he was in Chicago and um, uh, he's most well known, I'm, I'm sure most of you know about him. And he told me, Nishit, we decided not to ban bitcoins because we think when the technology in the nascent stage, we should not clip it. And uh, they, we want to see how it is. There are a number of benefits to bitcoins. For example, uh, transaction cost is nearly zero. They are secure payment, irreversible transactions and stuff like that. So there are some benefits to the whole new technology. But what I liked the most was the pragmatic approach in which government, you know, uh, address this issue and uh, uh, it's a great delight, I think. That, that's something to talk good about India as well. So with those things, uh, I, I would just uh, uh, like um, uh, to, um, I think Mahesh, you are not interested in the morning, right? And um, um, uh, you were introduced yesterday, so maybe yeah. you want to say a word about yourself. Sure, so I'm, I'm based Yari. in Singapore and uh, do a lot of structuring for uh, MNCs, uh, tech companies, uh, e-com companies getting into India and also a lot of Indian companies globalizing, so a lot of the structure, uh, structures and strategies. Yeah. yeah, so he heads our international techs at Singapore and um, there's globalization and stuff like that as well. Uh, then maybe Simon, you introduce yourself. Simon, you are not here in the morning. Okay. So. Sure. So I co-head the uh, M&A and competition law practice at Nishat Desai, and um, I think today's uh, panel we, we will be discussing antitrust issues on um, on e-commerce. So uh, there are a number of issues that relate to the electronic payment system, the taxation of e-commerce, and uh, even antitrust issues. As you could see, all the whole team is here. Uh, let me start with Gauri, whom you heard in the morning uh, or in the early <coughs> session. Uh, what are the common models uh, for online uh, payment uh, options which uh, the e-commerce industry uses in India? Uh, I have a, what I've done is because you know the payment is slightly complex and you need to have certain you know sure. visual slides. Yeah, uh, so by the time the slides are put up by Milind, uh, I'll just read out what the Reserve Bank of India said, you know, on Bitcoins, what Nishit was mentioning, and the wording is very interesting. It's the Reserve Bank of India says, it is reported that uh, virtual currencies such as Bitcoins are being traded on exchange platforms set up in various jurisdictions, um, whose legal status is also unclear. Hence, the traders of virtual currencies on such platforms are exposed to legal as well as financial um, risks. So they have just made this statement and basically it's like a warning, but they have not gone ahead and, you know, uh, banned any trading or any, uh, you know, uh, 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 any dealings in the Bitcoins. But the other interesting thing uh, that we have seen uh, in the Bitcoin context is uh, the authorities are not able to understand what it means. So one of our clients uh, is, uh, you know, uh, it seems uh, on the exchange, uh, certain uh, entity which is into is some illegal activities, they happen to trade on bitcoins, and there were certain you know commercial dealings with the exchange on the exchange, etc. So now the police authorities are investigating, and they are you know uh, having uh, uh, day after day they are investigating and trying to figure out what does it mean and how, uh, whether or not uh, you know this bitcoin deal that happened online. Uh, has any linkage with the offline, uh, you know, illegal activity that may have happened, or it is just uh, a coincidence that the same entity traded in Bitcoin. So, uh, you know, it, it is getting a little complex for authorities to understand. So, as, uh, you know, Sandhya mentioned in the earlier panel, the, the education uh, of the regulators is very important. Now, before I get into the payment, you know, various models, uh, 
almost on a weekly basis you know we get these queries on various payment uh, models and I, I you know we feel rather surprised that every client that comes in comes up with a new model and we have to rack our brains as to where in the scheme of things you know this particular thing falls uh, so what happens sometimes is uh, uh, you know you need to have a dialogue uh, with your partners in who are in the you know whom you are partnering for the payment uh, uh, you know processing uh, you need to partner with the gateway operators you need to uh, you know clearly understand as to how the ecosystem works and you know at the end of this particular thing i will give you some of the you know takeaways as well so let's just quickly jump into what are the payment options that we have seen and i don't think they are unco you know which, which are uh, not known in the us uh, the interesting part is in India, you have almost now, uh, uh, I, I believe, up almost you know up to 900 million mobiles, and you will have, uh, you know, more and more uh, transactions happening on mobile. And when I say mobile, one is access to the internet through which you are, you know, using your credit card, but the other is actually the pay the micro payments in India. You know, interestingly, micro payment is something is the key for the transactions so the micro payments are happening also through your uh, you know uh, mobile uh, uh, bills whether it is prepaid or postpaid so you know those are the other models developing uh, as well uh, there are 55 banks in india who have got the you know license to issue the mobile uh, 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 you know uh, get into the mobile uh, licensing uh, now let us see who are the players uh, so you typically have the banks uh, obviously in the entire scheme of things then you have prepaid instrument operators so India has recognized prepaid instrument and in even in the Bitcoin context you know there could be an argument to say that whether Bitcoin represents a stored value and therefore you know it the prepaid instrument guidelines should get attracted uh, the other uh, so these are the two top boxes they actually transact into the money in the sense are in the you know in the uh, uh, from a process perspective they are the ones who are processing the the funds getting transferred uh, uh, or handling of the funds the second layer is the payment gateway operators uh, like you have the cc avenue or two checkout in the us or you know in india we also have somebody called ebs uh, you have PayPal, so all of them fall into this category of payment gateway operators. Then you have aggregators. So another model that we have seen in India is uh, you have, say, there are various telcos, uh, and there are aggregators who have tied up with the telcos. So suppose you are a merchant who wants to uh, you know, uh, transact. You don't have to go to each telco to do a deal, but you just go to the aggregator and uh, sign up with the aggregator who uh, has a back-to-back -back contract with the telcos. So you will have these uh, you know, other models developing as well. And because in India you have micro payments, as I mentioned, the aggregator model works well. Then you also have a technology provider where you have you know, uh, the device attached to the mobile for scanning your card, etc. So those are some of the queries also come up. Their data protection issues come up then you obviously have the merchant and the customer. So in, in the entire scheme of things, um, what happens is uh, when the Reserve Bank of India, you know, they write uh, early, early 2000, they started to come out with policy. And later on, you know, from 2005 to 2009, they had another policy or a vision statement. So the vision that they are, the government is looking at is to have a, you know, to establish me, uh, establishment of the safe, secure, sound, and efficient payment and settlement system for the country. And therefore, they got you know the Payment Settlement Act of 2007, which was recently amended to protect the consumers, in fact, even in case of insolvencies of you know the, the, the parties involved. Uh, then there are various guidelines and regulations issued by the Reserve Bank of India under this act. And of course, you have the exchange control regulations. And where they come in, I will you know, show with uh, some uh, uh, you know, uh, diagrams. So quickly, so you have you know, the Payment Settlement Act. You have prepaid instruments, uh, uh, you know, uh, regulations. Uh, you have intermediary, which are the payment gateway operators regulations. You uh, obviously, we have you know, Anti-Money Laundering Act. So there are compliances for all of these. Uh, under the that particular uh, uh, you know uh, guidance including the kyc requirements and why, how the kyc comes into play in different models i'll discuss quickly and of course the data protection in the earlier session which raki discussed in all these scheme of things what is important is to figure out what is the role of each party because when you have multiple parties involved 
uh, uh, you know, it gets very complicated as to who is to comply with which law. Uh, so online payment very quickly before I get into the payment gateway model, India introduced few years back what is called as two-factor authentication. That means when you are making an online credit card payment, what is called as card not present transaction, where physically the card is not pay present at the terminal, uh, then you need a second factor authentication by way of an SMS on your mobile where you will you know have a code which you need to insert so this start this created a lot actually a lot of issues for your recurring payments so some of the clients who are more into the content business uh, for example you know subscription models where you you know subscribe online they actually had to shift their you know businesses outside of india because the recurring payment was getting very difficult with the two factor authentication there is some relaxation recently which is being you know uh, looked into which is for the small transactions but these are more of nfc now icici bank in fact came out uh, what is called as near field devices so if you have a near field device technology being used then for small transactions of about $30, which uh, in India may be slightly, you know, 2,000 rupees, but in, in, in the U.S. context, if you see, it's purely $30. So um, that is uh, the relaxation. And of course, you have other guidelines for the card payments. So when you look at any prepaid instruments, um, you know, I'm sl taking slightly long uh, on this particular question, no but I'm trying to cover all the points uh, quickly. No, no, I so, think it's important because... Uh, yeah. yeah, so when we look at the prepaid instruments, I think it is well known these concepts, which is open, semi-closed and closed. Closed is when, for example, you know, Walmart is issuing, uh, uh, you know, a prepaid instrument, which can be only redeemed as a, at the Walmart portal. Semi-closed is, you know, identified number of uh, merchants where you can redeem. And open is anybody can, uh, you know, a base, so rather at any merchant location you can redeem. So when we look at any model, I'm not getting into this because there are two complex issues in this, but I'm just going to address what are the issues that need to be looked into is to who can issue. For example, uh, open can be issued in India currently only by the banks. Uh, not by any merchant, or you know, not by any merchant. Whereas closed, uh, you know, obviously any merchant, uh, 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 you know, can uh, open it. But there are certain eligibility criteria. For example, what is your net worth, etc. Uh, what are the limits? So each type of instrument has been given certain limits. Uh, so beyond that, you cannot have a, that particular prepaid card. Uh, when I say prepaid card, card, let me clarify, it, this also not only includes physical prepaid card, but also virtual, like mobile wallets, e-wallets, etc. Uh, can the cards be reloaded? There are certain requirements uh, that need to, com to be complied with as to who can reload the card. Uh, does the issuer himself need to reload the card? Can he appoint the agents? Because in the Indian context, you need to realize that not many will have a credit card. So in the Indian context, absence of credit card is very common and that's the reason prepaid instruments become very you know important that by merely a bank transfer you can you know reload your card and therefore uh, you know having local agents um, uh, at different locations to reload your card also become critical so that's something that has been recognized uh, then can the monies be withdrawn or transferred and the answer is no once you have created a wallet you simply need to uh, you know, use that particular wallet for, you know, purchase of goods or services. Uh, you can transfer that uh, to another such similar card, but uh, withdrawal is not, you know, allowed. This probably because, uh, you know, from an anti-money laundering perspective, uh, uh, you know, the government has basically put this restriction and there are certain ongoing compliances that also have to be looked into. So, you know, this is in short, uh, the issues to be looked into whenever you're looking at having or entering into a business of prepaid instruments. Now, what we see most common is the, uh, is the payment gateway. So I'm just going to quickly show, uh, you know, so this is a payment gateway operator. Now here I'm talking about the domestic sales. So one will wonder why am I distinguishing between domestic export and import? This is because of the exchange control regulations. And uh, I think on the earlier panel, you know, Vaibhava alluded to the Uber issue. So what basically happened was that the, the, the as you know, the Uber model, uh, the taxi drivers are supposed to be independent. And if you see the terms and conditions also, that Uber is merely providing, it's, it's not 
not a taxi company or a cab company, but it is a technology company providing you the platform. So in that context, uh, what what the deal that was happening is the Indian customer is getting into a ca cab and paying Uber, which the money was being transferred outside of India. And then Uber in turn was a, was making the payment to the drivers by transferring the monies to their accounts. So who is providing service? Which service is being provided? The service of a cab, right? The service is pro being provided by the Indian cab driver to the Indian consumer. So it's a completely domestic transaction. In such a case, it is not permitted that the money goes out of country and that is where you know Uber faces the issue. So uh, basically, therefore, if you have to set up a payment gateway operating business in India, you need to have, and if you're going to cater to the domestic transactions, you do need to have uh, you know, this particular uh, entity, which, is, uh, you know, which basically provides that particular service. And this entity, in fact, is not going to transact into money. It is going to tie up with the bank. And the bank is going to have a nodal account this in which the so let's see the flow of funds right um, so flow of funds is from customer to the payment uh, gateway operator but that money is actually going to the bank and the bank is then putting the money in the nodal account and from this nodal account which is controlled by the bank the merchant gets paid and whatever the fees of the payment gateway operator for the providing of this service get paid. So uh, if you see, this is where the payment is actually happening. So this is a model which you will see even in the export sales. Now in the export sales, one important thing is that the money has to come into India within a particular timeline. So it's a publicly reported issue. PayPal had this issue where uh, they were in fact providing the payment gateway services, but the money was being uh, kept outside of India and was not uh, by the you know by the Indian merchants and was not brought into uh, you know India uh, within a specified timeline. So this merchant was not bringing the money back into India within specified timeline. So in therefore, uh, the Reserve Bank of India then, uh, you know, uh, basically went after PayPal. They had to, you know, uh, issue new guidelines where the foreign gateway operator needs to open a nodal account in India or what they call as Nostro account. So, you know, the, 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 these are some of the critical issues. Now, the other model, which is the import. This becomes extremely difficult in the con because of the certain restrictions that the Reserve Bank of India has imposed. Now let us see what happens. So suppose you have a payment gateway operator in India uh, uh, and you have a merchant outside of India. This payment gateway operator is not allowed to have a merchant which is located outside India as its customer. So this payment gateway operator if it's accepting the rupee amount from the payment, uh, you know, from Indian customer, he cannot remit that to the merchant, unfortunately. So the model that we have seen now is the collection agent model, where the merchant appoints a, account, appoints a collection agent in India. Again, when the collection agent model is developing, and we are currently handling such a case uh, uh, currently, where this collection agent, in fact, will need an RBI approval to act as a collection agent of this merchant. So, you know, this is the, the reason why all this is coming up is because of the, you know, the KYC requirement and the like. So whenever you're doing any e-commerce transaction in India, please bear in mind whether it's a local sale, export sale, import sale, who is located where, where is the flow of funds. So we always want the flow of funds to examine, you know, and Mahesh will discuss the tax issues attached to all of this because <coughs> we always, you know, end up talking to the tax members to figure out in all of this where, you know, and how the tax is being, uh, uh, you know, looked into. So um, I will, uh, you know, not go into too much details about, uh, you know, the other mobile and all that. Happy to take questions if you have any. But the takeaways are regulations are still evolving in India, in India. So for example, recently we were looking into the COD model, which is a cash on delivery model uh, for the foreign merchants. So similar exchange is control issues are going to arise. So we need to make a business case with the Reserve Bank of India, explain them the model, 
and see how uh, you know they they understand that model and uh, how they are able to work with you uh, so that you know you can carry out all the compliances so basically review all the regulations when multiple parties are involved identify the role and responsibility um, if you are setting up the software or technology compliance then look at all the data protection and kyc requirements and uh, in case of loopholes do approach the regulators because that's the best uh, uh, you know approach that we believe be transparent with the regulators because they are also in the learning phase and they will support you if they believe that what you are doing in fact benefits the consumers in india so you do need to make that case so that they are able to you know help you with coming out with all these uh, you know uh, various regulations so i, I thought thank I'll, you i think yeah. uh, gauri uh, let me just have my microphone on uh, thank you so much, Gauri. I think it was very good expose on the whole payment uh, system in India and the trickier stuff. Fundamentally, India has already moved to current account convertibility. So regular payments can be made. Only there are restrictions, restrictions are only on the capital account payments. So it is not that ultimately you cannot remit money, but the process that you need to follow has to be followed. That's the theme of the whole thing. And therefore, you need to understand what are the different models that are uh, uh, developed now for remittances of funds, uh, you know, overseas? And um, um, uh, one uh, other thing is, uh, you know, uh, going back to e-commerce thing. Uh, Mahesh, do you want to add something uh, at this point in time on tax? Sure. Um, uh Tax, so in as, I'm not sure how many uh, tax guys are here, of course, apart from Nishit, but uh, I'll probably make it very simple. Um, tax is can be a nightmare in India. Yesterday we discussed a lot of uh, the tax issues when you have investments and M&A in India. Uh, e even in um, most e-commerce models, most e-commerce transactions, tax becomes a, a, a big issue, but this is something that can be managed. Now, three major issues when it comes to tax. One is uh, withholding tax. A withholding tax can become quite, quite uh, you know, it's, it's quite a sticky issue when you're uh, uh, negotiating with a customer and then customer wants to withhold tax when you feel, when you know that tax should not be withheld and the customer is, uh, the, the, the reason why, and, uh, and your Indian customer uh, would like to withhold tax is because if he does not withhold tax, then he's not allowed uh, deductions on, on those payments, tax deductions. And also the Indian tax department usually goes after the person making the payment, catching the, you know, so for failing to withhold tax. So withholding tax becomes a very sticky issue. And the uh, worst case scenario is where uh, your customer withholds tax and then you don't get a credit for that tax back in the U.S. That's a worst case scenario because the U.S. government thinks that India does not have a right to withhold that tax. It is inconsistent with what the tax treaty says, and then uh, U.S. does not give a credit. So th that's the worst case scenario. That's something which uh, w one should uh, uh, avoid. Now, uh, if you take typical uh, uh, e-com model, let's say it's just a soft, direct software license, or even if it is a SaaS or or even any service, let's say a web hosting service, right, and provide it to customers in India or software license to customers in India, right, or, or, or over the cloud you're providing a service to a customer in India. Now, the payments, the service fees should not be taxed in India. It should not be subject to any withholding tax, and this is the international standard. If a similar service is provided to customers in the U.S., U.S. will not uh, impose withholding taxes, right? But the problem is... In India, the tax department, they, they've come up with these, uh, there were some retrospective amendments to the definitions of uh, what is royalty payments and what is called fees for technical services. And under Indian law, uh, you may, you'll have to, for all these models, for whether it's just a software license or just a SaaS uh, payment, uh, you, you have to withhold tax. The withholding tax just was 25%, but with the 2015 uh, budget, it's been reduced to 10%. But still, the, uh, you don't want a situation where Taxes withheld by your customers because he has no choice, right? And then uh, you, you don't get a credit in the U.S. because this is something which is not consistent with the tax treaty. So that's one issue uh, one always runs into. Withholding taxes, you're probably the number one issue when, you, uh, when you're dealing with uh, India. Now, uh, another nuance with withholding tax, while the tax may apply, uh, you, you, there is always a possibility that you get relief under the tax treaty. For example, the, the ta we, have a, a very, uh, we have a treaty with the U.S., India and the U.S., and based on the treaty, none of these payments should be subject to withholding tax. But to be entitled to treaty to relief under the treaty, you first the uh, the, the U.S. company first has to obtain a tax residency certificate 
from the U.S. authorities. Now this has become a standard. The uh, IRS is giving that, so that's it's just a, a procedural formality. And then you'll need to provide some sort of a comfort to the uh, your customer in India that you do not have a PE, a PE in the sense of permanent establishment or a presence in India. We'll come to PE again uh, subsequently. Uh, so th that's a discussion you will always inevitably get into with customers on withholding tax, customer wants to withhold tax, and then you, you have to provide some comfort to the customer that, no, we are, we are entitled to this relief under the treaty, and hence you should not withhold tax. So th th that's, uh, that's one big issue. Second is permanent establishment. Now, uh, just to simply, p permanent establishment essentially is the, uh, kind of the presence that you have in India. Let's say you're a US company, you have an office in India, or you have a branch in India, right? Or you have an agent, a dependent, a an exclusive agent in India who's concluding contracts with your customers. So it is like the US concept of ECI, or effectively connected income. So if you have a permanent establishment in India, although any your uh, payments from your customers should not be taxed in India normally, because you have a permanent establishment in India, you could be subject to a 42% tax. And this is not the withholding tax for royalties or technical service. This is a, this is regular uh, corporate tax uh, attributable to your uh, permanent establishment. Now, per permanent establishment has always been a very simple concept. You have a fixed place of business, you have an office, or you have a branch, or you know, a dependent agent. But with e-commerce, there's various uh, strange scenarios you uh, come, in, come across and uh, creating very new permanent establishment risks. Now, Indian Tax Department has been very creative on this. They've been trying to take a view that websites can be a permanent establishment. So Google has a PE all over the world, right? And websites, and then they say intangible. Intellectual property itself can be a permanent establishment. It's, it's, you, the traditional concept is you have an office, a fixed base, but now the tax department is saying, with technology changes in technology, you need to you need to move towards something called a virtual permanent establishment because there's so much revenues coming out of India, so such a big customer base. Yes, there is some sort of a presence, but it's not the physical presence as we conventionally understood. It's e-commerce, so let's try to have a per virtual PE. So th there's some tension on that. There's some litigation on that. Some, in some cases, uh, uh, the several, uh, some tech companies have. Uh, had to pay tax because of that, right? So permanent establishment in the e-com age uh, scenario is something which uh, one has to be uh, cautious, uh, careful about. Mahesh, just yeah. before you move on to the next point, I think on the PE, what we have seen also is the location of the servers. Absolutely. So, you know, uh, yeah, for example, yeah. sometimes what happens is just to have a mirror server in India for, you know, better traffic or better speed, yeah. companies may want to, you know, uh, lease servers in India. Yeah which then may create some issue if I'm not wrong. That's, that's correct, because they, they're arguing that a server is not just a conduit or a communication channel, it's, a, it's, it's actually processing information, yes, it's collecting, so it is a permanent establishment. It's as good as having a small office there, but it's a virtual office, it's through a server. Right? And there are cases where they say that uh, computerized reservation terminals in India have, uh, should uh, constitute a permanent establishment, right? because it's actual business operation through that one smart device uh, sitting in India. So P is an issue. Another major issue is transfer pricing. Um, a lot of uh, firms, uh, a lot of American firms having uh, um, large outsourcing operations in India. India has always been a cost center. But of course, as you know, uh, as uh, Jack Welch uh, said in the morning, they went in search of low cost but found high brains, right? And that's what even not, uh, 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 and you got to pay for that. And that's what the tax department is saying. They said, you, you come to India, you got to pay. It's, no, it's not just a small cost plus. You got to pay, there's so much more. Uh, they're arguing that India is not just low cost, but there are a lot of locational and geographic advantages of being in India. It is access to the market, the fact that, uh, in, so they're, they're saying it's, it's not just cost plus, but probably a share of your global profit should be attributed to India. So transfer pricing, or, or to, to the, um, uh, the, your, uh, the fees you pay to, the, uh, to your Indian subsidiary or to your outsourcing arm. Right, so transfer pricing is a major issue. It, uh, there's a lot of litigation, and this is across the world. Even US, some of the biggest tax litigation is transfer pricing. It's the same in India. Uh, they, they've tried to come out with some sort of safe harbors, saying that you know, for BPOs or cap knowledge process outsourcing, you have uh, you know, tw cost plus 20, 25%, which is again quite outrageous. So th that really did not, did not go well with the industry. So th th this is one area where uh, you need to get your transfer pricing strategy right, get the uh, markup right, and uh, see how to mitigate. And uh, in, in terms of um, mitigating risks, 
uh, advanced rulings have become very quite popular. They provide a lot of certainty to investors. So let's say you're doing a, a transaction, you, you have a business model, um, an e-com business model, lot big customer base in India, and you know you'll every time you contract with customer, you'll get into this withholding tax issue, you'll get into issues of permanent establishment or transfer pricing. Go to the advanced ruling authority. It's a very high level. It's like you have private letter rulings in the U.S. It's a high, it's a very high level body. They give binding rulings, binding on the taxpayer and binding on the Indian tax department. And they they understand in international business. They understand international transaction and international tax. So you you're, uh, so once you get a positive ruling, it it gives all the certainty. And then there is no question of any withholding tax or any litigation. Right, so because litigation in India is, is very long run. In fact, tax litigation can go on for uh, uh, for over a decade. So with advanced rulings, you completely cut short all of that and um, get, and get certainty as early as possible. For transfer pricing, uh, we have a new uh, uh, APA, that is the Advanced Pricing Agreement Regime. Uh, the idea is you, you get into some sort of a contract with the uh, uh, Indian government saying that we, we have this center uh, in India, this, uh, uh, th these are the services. The uh, functions, assets, risks in India are uh, very minimal. It's just cost plus this. We get into an agreement that for five years, this is the uh, cost plus we are going to be charging. It, it, gives, it's, uh, it should give a lot of certainty. And uh, both unilateral, where only Indian government, also bilateral, where you can get involve the US revenue and the Indian revenue and uh, get a, a bilateral APA. So uh, APAs are becoming, a lot of companies are now uh, have filed the APA applications. It's hopefully, that should provide a lot of certainty on transfer pricing. And uh, uh, on withholding tax issue, one strategy, so because sometimes you're dealing with a customer. Right? I'll give you one uh, live example. So there's a, 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 a very uh, a large US university provide, which provides services to a, uh, an Indian group. It, it, it was just a training program for officers of that Indian company. And uh, there's a $10 million payment that had to be made to the US university. And now the university, it's, it's an exempt entity in the US. So they, they don't want to pay tax in India because there's no question of any tax credit in the US. Now, under the India-US tax treaty, it's very clear that there is no withholding tax, right? Because it's an educational institution. It's a very recognized, reputed institution in the US. No withholding tax in India. But the, the company, the, which is their client in India, saying, they say, yes, we know that. But we know that we'll get into litigation for not withholding tax, so we're just going to withhold tax. And if you have an issue, you, you go to the tax department, get a refund, or uh, it's, it's your problem, right? So that's something which one gets into. So what we did is, so we gave a legal opinion explaining why there is no withholding tax, spoke with the, to the company, explained they're going to try to provide that comfort. So that, that's one strategy that uh, one would normally uh, do to get, and of course, that also gives some sort of protection against penalties and things like that. So just a few strategies, how we will deal with it. So there, there are risks, tax is a big issue, but can be managed. Yeah. I think just to add, I think uh, the indirect tax, which hopefully with the GST, you know, may yeah. get reduced. But in my experience, whenever we, we look at all these fancy structures, which I showed earlier, yeah. who's providing services to whom, and because of that, you know, what are the service uh, tax implications? So, yeah. you know, the client sends us a very nice Excel sheet to figure out at what stage what is happening. So yeah. that that is another issue that we have seen as yeah, well. Yeah, indirect taxes, yeah. service tax, and also VAT, because um, you know, whether it's applicable to software or when you have software embedded onto hardware, a lot of uh, uh, issues in indirect tax as well. And again, I mean, just one point on GST. GST is going to be a game changer in India. Uh, because GST uh, stands for? The goods and services tax. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we don't have, a lot of countries have a GST. But in India, you have, of course, there's income tax, which we were talking about all, all along. But there's a lot, several indirect, layers of indirect taxes or consumption taxes. You have, you have, of course, you have customs when you import uh, goods. And then you have uh, service tax, which is at a federal level. You have central excise on production. You have VAT on sales, which is imposed by the sales tax. On cross on interstate sale, you have a central sales tax. You have octroi. And there's several indirect taxes. So now they're going to, uh, hopefully, by 2016, they're going to have one common GST for the whole of India. They're still trying to, they're, they're trying to decide on what is the rate of that. Right, because for example, service tax is around uh, uh, right now around 14 percent. Uh, VAT is around 12 percent. So you add all, and of course, 12 around 12.5 percent of excise. It all adds up to around 27, 30 percent of uh, consumption taxes. Now with VAT, they're thinking of pegging it at around 20 to 24 percent. Uh, uh, hopefully, probably below 20, because I think the global standard is in the 10 to uh, 20 percent range. So, uh, but once GST is introduced, they say that it will add 2% to India's growth rate, which already now is probably uh, uh, going to be higher than China. So G I think GST is going to be a very positive development, which will also help uh, e-commerce. Yeah. 
Um, Mahesh, after listening to you, it seems to me that you can expect Jack Welch to be examined and called in the witness box because he said that it's brain count that matters, right? So now tax department will call them in favor and also hold and him he, responsible he ha, he for the, the past tax. He has the money to pay the taxes, so he won't mind. So <laughs> don't be surprised if, uh, uh, like Mr. Bajaj, right? He was uh, held up at one point of time, uh, EBS uh, CEO, right? Uh, so perhaps Jack Wells will also help to develop new law, uh, maybe. Uh, but don't be surprised this kind of situation does arise at times. Uh, I think Samsung chairman was, uh, you know, uh, threatened to be arrested, so he couldn't come to India. So it's very surprising that, you know, uh, sometimes authorities take that view, of course, then when matters go high up, then things get sorted out. Uh, I believe in the case of uh, Mr. Bajaj, uh, it became a diplomatic issue as well. But fortunately, somewhere along the line, it got uh, resolved. Uh, so one has to be very careful about the tax and other kind of situations. Um, but one other interesting angle that arises out of this is uh, antitrust law. As I see uh, on a global basis, uh, IP has become very interesting uh, part of tax laws. About 60 to 80 percent of tax problems involve IP issues royalties, fees for technical services, stuff like that. Remaining 20, 30 percent are permanent establishment issue. Majority of them, transfer pricing of intangibles, okay. So if you see IP and international tax goes so much hand in hand, but most of the time we do that. Even when mergers or acquisitions happen, about 60 to 80 percent mergers and acquisitions are all about IP. But often when due diligence are done, we do not pay enough attention on the IP because everybody checks the box for corporate, 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 but IP is not understood as a strategic objective. And that is very important to, and third dimension is in the context of antitrust law, uh, in India we call competition uh, law. Uh, so, you know, maybe Simon, uh, who is an expert on that, may give some comment. So, what are the types of e-commerce models uh, which may attract uh, antitrust law in India? Are there any safe harbors or, uh, you know, how, how do you go about it? Thanks, Nishit. So, um, just to give the, the room an overview of, you know, our antitrust laws, it's, it is a blend of both EU as well as um, US antitrust laws. Um, and under, I mean, the, the most common used uh, principles here are, is, are twofold. One is, of course, an abuse of dominance where any entity today that is dominant uh, cannot really abuse its power by entering into certain types of contracts or imposing unfair terms and conditions in its goods and services. Uh, the second broader ambit is any entity that enters into an agreement uh, which is anti-competitive is considered that that sort of an agreement is considered void. Now, um, you know, our, our, our law is extremely nascent, so it, it is still sort of finding ways as to how the Competition Commission of India is going to sort of retaliate to newer problems and newer issues. And, um, you know, we've been talking today about e-commerce companies, we've been talking about the flip cards of the world, we've been talking about, um, you know, um, Amazon and things like that. And, you know, from, from an Indian consumer perspective, one issue that people most likely go to the internet is to find the best deal. Um, you know, a, any, 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 um, a deal that is, that is deep discounted or th there's a discount deal online. That's how, you know, sort of e-commerce companies at least attracting consumers in addition to, in addition to, you know, ensuring speedy delivery in, uh, in, uh, in, in addition to ease of business, ease of doing business. But one strong aspect that e-commerce companies in India, at least, are 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 um, you know harping on is sort of discounts. Um, there was a very interesting case um, you know recently against uh, many of the large e-commerce companies, uh, wherein there was um, you know uh, there was a complainant which suggested that these e-commerce companies were you know engaging in anti-competitive activities for two reasons. One, they contended that these sort of price discounts uh, amounted to an abuse of dominance. And second is they contended that, you know, these e-commerce companies enter into exclusive agreements with, um, with, with uh, retailers and, and thereby that sort of an agreement as well is anti-competitive. 
Um, you know, fortunately, the Competition Commission of India, you know, although I don't really necessarily agree with, with how they've portrayed their decision, because there are a lot of things that need to be considered from an e-commerce, uh, when, when analyzing anti-competitive arrangements from an e-commerce perspective. But the Competition Commission of India, you know, I think everyone is sort of in agreement with, with, with the final decision, uh, suggested that, you know, that, that the complaint was unfounded and was not, um, you know, in, in violation of competition laws. And the reason being as, f as follows. Like I said, you know, today under, under the prohibition of anti-competitive agreements, you have twofold agreements that can't be entered into. One is horizontal arrangements, which is you know cartel-like situations, and second are vertical arrangements, tie-ups uh, and things like that. Now, exclusive agreements could be one such arrangement, which you know which which uh, gets attracted by virtue of the uh, Competition Act. But you have to prove that such an agreement would, in effect, cause an appreciable adverse effect on competition for it to be anti-competitive, for it to be considered void. Now, what, what has been consistently contended with respect to exclusive agreements is as to whether the minute you enter into an exclusive agreement, is it, are you sort of, uh, you know, uh, apportioning the market? Are you not allowing others to sort of thrive? Um, very important in arriving at this decision as to whether something causes an appreciable adverse effect of, on competition is to understand the market as a whole. Now, you know, more um, developed jurisdictions have sometimes delineated the market of e-commerce and the market of brick and mortar separately, stating that the e-commerce model or the e-commerce market caters to a different set of consumers and the brick and mortar, uh, you know, addresses a, a, a different set of com consumers as well, and therefore you can't really merge the two markets, and therefore the effect on competition has to be viewed as, you know, uh, with respect to a particular market. Our regulator has not really gone into this. The only thing that it contended was that, you know, such exclusive agreements was not anti-competitive because it brought about certain pro-competitive effects. It gave consumers, you know, the ability to, to have access to these products and things like that, and therefore they found the, um, uh, the charge unfounded. The second bit is wh whether, you know, having discounts today um, is again anti-competitive. Now, the way our act is worded is that, you know, everyone can, can, can give as much discounts as they want, or predatory pricing is not something that is um, that is that is you know a charge against companies that are not dominant. If and only if you are a dominant entity, can you be f uh, can you be guilty of a charge of predatory pricing if that is what it is you do? And therefore, the the commission found, especially since the e-commerce model is sort of very nascent. Um, uh, you know, they found that only one percent of the entire um, of the retail market was was an e-commerce uh, was through the e-commerce sector. They merged both markets and suggested that there were so many players, and therefore not one of them could be just you know dominant. Which is why they found that the charge of predatory pricing or, or deep discounts given by e-commerce companies again not anti-competitive. In fact, what they suggested was that you know it brought about some pro-competitive um, uh, you know effects to the consumer. But having said that, I mean our jurisprudence is sort of developing, um, assuming that you have you know a different a, a, a different analysis of the product market and a different analysis of of um, of, of the geographic market. Maybe conclusions could be different, uh, but these are two problems that e-commerce companies could, um, uh, you know, could could face. One would ask about safe harbors. I mean, the, our Competition Act does recognize that anything done to protect one's IP uh, in furtherance of a right or in furtherance of a, a, a you know registered right um, is something that is will not be considered um, anti-competitive. But what that is has not been. Um, has not been, you know, decided by the Competition Commission of India yet, so it's 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 still developing. But there are various other, you know, issues that are being looked at from a technology pers perspective. I mean, we've all heard that Google today is facing, you know, EU antitrust um, uh, in, uh, investigations, although it's been cleared of 
U.S. antitrust uh, investigations. Um, the, uh, the European Union is looking at it. The Competition Commission of India is also looking at, at Google in terms of you know, how it's, uh, uh, the, the charges are of manipulation of searches as to whether it's abusing its, its, its power um, in, in, in how it uh, you know, uh, brings about searches. So, it's, so you're facing these, these kind of um, uh, issues from, from an IT sector. Um, also, the Competition Commission of India is looking at big data, net neutrality, to see whether that today has antitrust implications in India. So, um, you know, we're going to see a lot of new things that, that develop, but our, um, our law is sort of drawn from the EU, and we look at US and, and EU jurisprudence to, um, to uh, and seek their guidance in, in arriving at, um, at, at, a, at a solution or a consensus. So th th thank you, uh, Simon, for providing insight uh, on the competition law aspect or antitrust law aspect uh, uh, relating to e-commerce. Uh, do you want to make any comment on that? No. Okay. So at this point in time, I think we are running slightly behind schedule, but we'll make sure that we don't extend overall uh, the deadline, uh, that 5.30 or maybe even earlier than that. So, uh, so l l any question at this point in time or anything else? Uh, Okay. You have a question? Sure. Uh, yes. I was on a panel recently uh, discussing the Indian consumer, and my sense, two of the other speakers uh, were both in e-commerce in India, and my uh, sense was that uh, COD was a much bigger problem, uh, both in terms of, um, I guess, people with a high net worth not wanting to use their credit cards because they don't want uh, record of their transactions, and so delivery boys typically show up and sometimes pick up a great deal of cash. The other uh, point that was made uh, by one of the speakers was that uh, often on a COD basis, uh, consumers will uh, use that payment model as a way of um, getting the best price, meaning that they will uh, perhaps order, let's say, a pair of black shoes from three different vendors, and whoever shows up first is who they pay for, and the other two they just don't accept. So could you talk a bit about... I have, I've heard worst. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure whether it is India, but uh, you know, one of the clients recently came and told us that the consumers actually snatch the goods in certain localities and then just run away and they do, don't even pay in the COD context. So, yeah, I mean, these are the models, yes, uh, there are some of these issues, but uh, according to me, you know, some of these business risks have to be, you know, understood in a particular market. So, in fact, you know, uh, we were discussing that how does it, you know, from a bad debt perspective or otherwise, you know, how do they deal with these situations? So, each company is coming out with their own models with the, you know, to deal with these risks. But yes, this is something which on the COD um, uh, basis, we do have, uh, you know, clients complaining about some of these issues. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's ultimately, uh, you know, contractually, because you may have certain contractual uh, sort of clauses to come over these, but then if these are now consumer friendly, you will not have, you know, consumers. So if you have a situation where some of these things happening in 10% of the transactions, Right, but if you have certain, you know, very onerous terms and conditions, then you may not even have your hundred, you know, that business that you ha have today, right? So, that's something in the, you know, Indian, you know, consumers are still maturing, so it will, it may take some time, but yes, we do hear some of these issues. Do you? I mean, you mentioned the yeah. number ten percent. Is it? No, I'm. Um, this is just no, no. This is something. Sorry, man. This is just. Um, it was an example. I don't okay. have numbers as such with me. Okay. Sorry. Thank you, Gauri. Uh, let me know one thing. Uh, the next session was, was there a question? Oh, uh, okay. But just before you ask a question, uh, a small announcement, that uh, the last panel, panel five, uh, relating to patent landscape study of uh, Internet of Things and new age technology, I think immediately after this we'll take up that. So I think other one was general discussion. So we'll push it down so you have an opportunity to understand what's happening and how we look at IoT and stuff like that. That was part of the subject. So uh, please go ahead and ask a question. Then we'll have uh, Shauri talk about the IoT and other kind of stuff. Sure. Uh, so the last question actually sparked a question that I had. Um, I know people would use cash on delivery for 
many nefarious reasons. Um, let's keep it at that. But the fact that they're doing cash on delivery, there's still a record of that transaction. The fact that it's not on their credit card, the company itself still has a record. Oh, it's cash on delivery. So what are they actually escaping in that sense? If, if they're getting in trouble for using some kind of illicit funds that they have built up in some cash form, is it the responsibility of the company to report the fact that it was actually a cash transaction? Or what, I'm trying to figure out what are they exactly gaining from this actual purchase besides maybe hiding it from their credit card bill because that record of that transaction is still on the, let's say, e-commerce site of some sort. Yes, you're right. I mean, I don't think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the, uh, there are two things in Indian context, right? As I was mentioning earlier, most may not even have a credit card. So, you know, that is the real reason. Probably mo majority of them are using COD. Uh, lawyers in India are not, you know, issued credit cards in some cases, by the way. So, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so that is one probable reason. Uh, the other is, uh, as uh, you know, Ken alluded, that they they want to see the product sometimes, you know, some because uh, how the product is, and in that, uh, you know, once they are comfortable with the product, they may actually go ahead and purchase it by delivery. The question also arises as to when has a transaction taken place? Is there an obligation to take, right? So that's what I was referring to when I said terms and conditions because this is something which we are exploring as well. So if you say that the transaction has concluded, then you know, can they just return? Because then the, then the other transaction takes over which is the return of goods. And in which case can there be a return of goods, right? So there may be only certain situations where can be, there be return of goods. So there are various of the, you know, these issues to be taken into account. But coming back to your point, you're right that um, at least in my view, there is nothing being hidden as such because you know the transaction actually is in the system uh, which has undertaken. The question will be that you know sometimes how how much cash payment. So these will be you know smaller transactions. There are certain transactions limit by which you know you can actually pay by cash. So that is another thing to be kept in mind as well. Simon, you want to add something? Uh, so, I mean, it's a mindset from an Indian perspective, as Gauri was saying. You know, you, you, it's a fear of the unknown. If I give my money and if I don't get my product, who do I talk to to get that product? So it's a mindset concept. I'd rather see something and pay for it. In a, you know, if, for instance, if, the, if, if somebody had um, a portable um, credit card machine and traveled along with the good, um, it's likely that people would just opt for the credit card machine, uh, you know, option. It's not that they don't really want to hide. It's a mindset concept of first you see, then you buy. So, yeah. Yeah, your uh, microphone is. Can you switch up the other one? Yeah. In fact, when I was reading some articles, that is what actually happens sometimes. That the the consumer opts for the COD, but when they actually see the goods, they're happy to pay by credit card. Yeah, this is actually this model of what Simon and Gauri mentioned is very popularly used by several uh, e-commerce companies, including Flipkart. Uh, so when the delivery boy will come, he will actually have a mobile machine uh, in hand and he will ask you, do you want to pay by cash or do you want to pay by card? And um, uh, especially people in metro areas end up paying by card. So I was chatting with someone and they said that, you know, credit card on delivery is possibly becoming more popular than even cash on delivery. And many times, you know, somebody wants to pay money in cash because they don't, they have not reported the income. It's like going to Starbucks and buying 100 cups of Starbucks, okay? You just don't know who's the cup. But on the other hand, Starbucks will report it as, as an income for tax purposes. But the payer, he doesn't report because he has not reported it anyway. So this is uh, very common in uh, mostly outside metros, as he said. Uh, where, you know, uh, people have cash money at times. But what I see, uh, and just to tell you a little uh, background of the whole thing, there was a time in 1970-71 where Indian tax rates, guess what? Can somebody guess what was the tax rate in 1970-71? 97.5%. And with that, there were some disallowances of expenses so some people paid 102% tax in India. I'm sure you like that because you are very public uh, charity minded and philanthropy and give back is a part of your life, at least in the US. So uh, that was a kind of regime. So what 
typically happen almost everything began to happen off uh, the record and they were cash full of monies and stuff like that. So there was huge amount of what is called black money in India and uh, over a period of time what has happened now is that our tax rates are only 30 percent from 97.5 percent to 30 percent which is even better than the US and a lot of people are giving up green card now and the citizenships because they want to migrate back to India. Uh, uh, last year perhaps there was large number of people who gave up you know that's uh, been happening but um, uh, so because of that you know now things are changing people want to use credit card people want to walk straight and stuff like that even corporate tax rate which is currently about 35 percent it is being brought down to a level of 25 percent so I think in many ways India is changing and that for the whole culture is also changing. There was a culture that okay, you cannot do anything unless you have cash money. You could never buy a house unless you pay back full of uh, cash. That was the time in 70s, 80s, even part 90s. But now in Mumbai, you can buy any property in complete check. Okay, in Delhi, it still happens. Okay, I'll deal with your question if there is any. But uh, what we see is the new generation that is coming up. They want to play by the rules. Uh, they want to engage lawyers and um, you know so what we see they want to go by rules you know some and, and even though it is sometimes difficult but still things are changing so you see the behavioral pattern also changing a lot it's a cultural change I think that itself has uh, uh, you know been uh, remarkable at this point in time you have some question so in that case why the government would make it difficult for uber to um, I've heard some stories from India that Uber is not allowed to take credit cards or something. So is that a part of it? Well, at times government becomes reactionary and that's one. So then, you know, we are complaints and other thing coming up. So maybe uh, you want to say, of course, yeah, I think we, we, can we, we will be able to talk a limited uh, amount of things yeah, because we are also working separate. with uh, yeah. Uber. So it will be, uh, you know, uh, we will we'll not go too much into detail, but she can give a general answer. Can you can you tell a little bit about bitcoins? Uh, I don't oh. know if we discussed, we discussed that before, a uh, whole story. So uh, bitcoins also will become important part of payment systems. Uh, Weibo, anybody want to talk about Uber? Uh, 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 not specific, but general thing. I yeah. think we discussed, you want to repeat that? No, we discussed that in fact during my payment thing. I know, but so he, that's why he I might have uh, not been there if you want. No, to I'll just. separately talk to him after the session. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, any other question for the time being? Uh, yeah. Um, is there any recourse? I see a lot of e-commerce sites in India have less security, uh, just generally. Like, uh, say, Amazon has a better security procedure than Flipkart or Snapdeal. Is there any recourse for a consumer if the data is stolen uh, in Indian uh, Indian law perspective? Is this taken already? Yeah. So basically, uh, in the Indian context, uh, you know, let me divide when you say data in the two two buckets. One is what we call as sensitive personal data and information, and the other is other personal information. So when you have sensitive personal data and information, there are certain specific requirements uh, insofar as security are, is concerned. But under the law, uh, it is a very, very peculiar provision. In fact, it says that the security provisions that, that you <coughs> need to adopt Sorry. can be mutually agreed between the parties. That means if your terms and conditions say that I'm going to adopt these security practices, then uh, if the consumer agrees to that, then that could be construed to be the actual relevant security policy. So. And there are certain ISO, you know, 27001, etc. So there is some, uh, you know, debate on that whether that is mandatory or not. Our view it is, is that it is not. So if uh, because of this particular small loophole in the law, there is a possibility that uh, you know the parties, uh, the relevant e-commerce, uh, you know, company may decide to have only a certain level of uh, security practices for the sensitive personal and data and information, and ask the consumer to agree to that. Obviously, consumer doesn't have a specific choice. The other personal information, uh, uh, you know, there is no such requirement. So under the law, uh, uh, you know, uh, but there are, I understand, you know, if you are actually dealing with the financial information, then the PCI standards, et cetera, are typically adopted, you know, as industry standards. 
so um, it depends on you know uh, uh, the contractual obligations it depends on what the company really wants to show as its standards because if you have higher standards uh, you know best practices then you get more consumer confidence in fact in the earlier session uh, you know where uh, uh, the ican representative david was talking uh, 51% of the you know uh, consumers in india are hesitant to do e-commerce or you know go on the internet to do e-commerce transactions because they fear uh, the breach of confidentiality or data so you know it's all about gaining consumer confidence uh, apart from you know what the law requires you to do so thank you anyone else uh